Good day, everybody, and welcome to episode two of Manufacturing Think Tank with Cliff Waldman. I'm Cliff Waldman. I'm the host of this new show, one of many on Manufacturing Talk Radio. For those of you who missed the pilot episode of Manufacturing Think Tank, you should know that I'm grateful to be in my fifth year of recording and broadcasting with Manufacturing Talk Radio, which really, in many ways, it's the third show that I've done because history has done some interesting things to us. I started off with Manufacturing Matters. That gave me a chance to talk about what I'm interested in, which is the broad themes of manufacturing. As our guest today knows very well, it's a very thematic sector. Um, Cliff Notes came with the pandemic when I had when we had us unfortunately put away thematic discussions and drag you through an historic period of crisis where things were happening week by week that involved your um, your that you know involved and affected your decision making. Now we're in sort of this interesting post pandemic period. It would be foolish to think that week by week concerns have left us. They most certainly have not. We talked about uh, the energy crisis in Europe coming from the Ukraine war and things like that are still going to be very much a part of our lives. But in many ways, I can get back at this point to talking about um, themes, long term themes. So we're going to have both and we're going to do it in a think tank sort of way. We're going to have the best guests. Certainly, if you had a list, one of the top themes for manufacturing, number either number one or number two, would be technology. And we have exactly the right guest today. I'm pleased to welcome my friend, Dr. Sean Dubrovic. He's the go-to economist um, for technology. And, and he is, um, I can spend the entire episode reading his credentials. He's trained as an economist at George Mason and Brigham University. He is the author of a New York Times bestseller. And I don't think I've ever, I, I, I cannot recall interviewing a guest who's had that distinction. His New York Times bestseller is called Digital Destiny, How the New Age of Data Will Transform the Way We Work, Live, and Communicate. And really, he explores how digital technology is affecting just about every aspect um, of our lives. For about a dozen years, he worked for the Consumer Technology Association, which uh, I live in Crystal City, that's across the street. They, I, I wake up and see it every morning. Uh, and that's across the street from me. He, um, he's the president of the Abrio Institute. Sean, have I pronounced that right, Abrio? You did, yes. Uh, Institute. And um, at the Abrio Institute, he does what he does best, which is to consult with everybody on disruptive technological trends and how they're going to affect their future from Fortune 100 companies to global, uh, what is it, global 1000 companies startups, nonprofits, government. Sean has become the go-to economist for technology. So Sean, welcome back to the network and welcome to the new show. Well, thank you so much, Cliff. It's great to be here with you. And I look forward to chatting about uh, what's coming next for manufacturers. Uh, well, we at this point, we still have to start with the pandemic. It's it's become almost ground zero for thinking about going uh, forward. And listen, the pandemic did just about everything to our lives. So I'm going to ask about what it did to uh, the life that I care about, which is the the forward advancement, technological advancement, process innovation in manufacturing. So did the pandemic accelerate, decelerate, or not change manufacturing process innovation? It was a big topic of discussion before it. What, what did it do? Did it throw it off course, or is it still going strong? Uh, obviously, I I think that the the pandemic changed the way companies were operating, and uh, after kind of those near term adjustments, those adjustments in the early days, you definitely saw an acceleration of innovation, an acceleration of technological adoption. Uh, you, for many companies, they had to define new processes, they had to create new products, they had to build products they'd never worked on if you you know you think back to those very early weeks of the pandemic and then kind of coming out of that uh it as you noted it was a constant adjustment but it was an adjustment that was often made in conjunction with technology uh there was definitely an increased focus on digital transformation there had, was an acceleration around new product development and new product introduction uh, the the pandemic 
if you think about consumer goods, the pandemic had really disrupted uh, our our normal patterns of life. And so we were forced into trying new products and new brands. And so, you know, brand loyalty was disrupted there for a little while. And so it, it gave manufacturing an opportunity to, to enter new spaces and enter new markets. Uh, if you think about all of the disaster preparedness plans and strategies that were implemented in the in the aftermath of the pandemic, those are becoming permanent additions and permanent fixtures to to operations plans. So uh, on, on net, I think the pandemic definitely accelerated ad advances in manufacturing processes, it accelerated innovation, certainly accelerated digital transformation. It was clearly a bumpy road early on. And I think now we're at a point where, you know, arguably at a transition where manufacturers are taking stock of what they accomplished over the last two years and building those plans forward as they think about what comes next. All right. So that's, that's in, in a sense, the, uh, the 30,000 foot question now, but um, let, let's come down to the boardroom since I have it in back of me and talk to CEOs. Um, they have to navigate a post pandemic technological landscape strategy. What, what's the, what, what's your advice to them? What's the best way to do that? It, it's, it's things just, it, it would come out of it. It's well, not totally, but it's, it's under control, but what do they do in terms of their technological thinking, given what you just said going forward? I think the key is to remember why you're implementing technology and why you're adopting technology. And it's to augment existing operations. It's to improve efficiencies. It's to uh, accomplish more than you were able to accomplish without it. So, you know, driving productivity, it's to allow you to enter into new markets. It, it enables you to overcome things that, uh, that are blocking your progression, so labor constraints or, or other inhibitors. So you first have to recognize what's the goal? What are we ultimately trying to accomplish? No strategy will be successful if you're just adopting technology for technology's sake. You really have to adopt it with a, the goal of accomplishing something. And, and with that in mind, companies need to continue to invest in their digital transformation something that we've been talking about now for 20 years. I think the next big shift is upon us as we move from digitization to datafication. And, and so companies need to build out the infrastructure so that they can really take advantage of all of these tools that are that are becoming available to them and take advantage of all of that, that data exhaust that's coming off of their existing uh, operations. I think they need to focus on building a, a dynamic and agile workforce. And so that means training employees to build and have skill sets that aren't easily replaced by automation. Uh, you know, automation is only one piece of the technology roadmap and one piece of the, of the technology journey. And there'll be lots of places we use technology in, in, in ways that don't automate something. And so, uh, you know, you need to build a, a skill set among your workforce that can really take advantage of the technology that's in place. Um, obviously, close collaboration, I think, is key, and technology will facilitate that as we think about the future of supply chains. Uh, a big component of that is greater integration and greater information flows between organizations. And uh, so really collaborating with, with stakeholders and with partners will be key for that. Well, what's your prediction for automation? Let's say the next five years. I mean, do you think given what you what you said in the first question and what you how you talk to CEOs in the second question, what, what's your forecast for not not numerically, but is automation going to accelerate? Are we going to see an upward, uh, uh, you know, uh, momentum in automation that again, five, let's say the next five years? We're definitely going to see an acceleration in, in automation. But again, I, I would note that automation is only one piece of the, the technology journey, and it should only be one piece of your technology roadmap. Uh, but certainly automation will accelerate. We'll, we'll use it in lots of different ways. Already, you see companies using it to automate skills that are, that are dangerous, that are mundane, yeah. 
I think that will, uh, you know, continue. Uh, we'll use it to automate skill sets that really don't take, I think, full advantage of human capability. So, you know, we often talk about augment, uh, augmenting human capability. And, and I think if there are ways we can better use humans, especially given what a scarce resource they have become within many of our organizations, then we'll, yeah. we'll automate pieces to free them up. And I think you're going to see that at every level of an organization. It isn't just automating manufacturing processes, but it's also automating HR functionality and capabilities so that you can free up your, you know, your chief HR officer so that they can really understand what the business is trying to achieve. And so that they can really hire and work to retain the type of workers you're going to need in the future. We're going to automate finance, uh, you know, tasks and other things so that you can free up your CFO and staff so that they can really drive value back into the organization. So it isn't just about automation. It also isn't just about automating one piece of your operation, uh, but automation is definitely growing as will these other pieces of, of your technology journey and your technology roadmap. You know, something simple like ERP, you're, you're definitely see, seeing companies looking to expand on their ERP capabilities so that they can really analyze and integrate and improve on the data that they have available and use, using that information to make better informed decisions. Uh, and, and so I think that's just one piece of it, but I think we're going to see a broadening of innovation, a broadening of investment in technology. You mentioned supply chains and, and certainly, and fortunately things have gotten somewhat better now, but for a couple of years, particularly in 2021 and part of 2022, uh, supply chains failed us and there, and it, it gave rise to a conversation about in the post pandemic world. Are supply chains going to become less global and more regional? And it's it's a debate that's ongoing. But let's say that happens. It does that, that that we sort of pull in the horns on supply chains. That that we we want to control them a little better, and we think it's better on balance that they become uh, regional. I I don't personally think so. But let's say that happens. What is the what are the implications of that decision for technological deployment? Well, I think there's two forces at play f first when we think about the move towards regional supply chains. Uh, it, it is certainly true that we, over a 20 or 30 year time horizon, built out long supply chains that were designed to squeeze out costs of production and, and in some ways drive efficiencies. Uh, what we found, obviously, was that those long supply chains, while they were cost effective, were brittle. And in the end, that that brittle aspect of those supply chains ended up being, in some instances, more expensive than we fully realized and fully internalized. So companies are now, I think, making the assessment of, you know, what are we willing to endure? Uh, what type of delays are we willing to endure. And many companies are saying we'd rather have schedule certainty at a yeah. higher price than schedule uncertainty at, at a lower price. So the supply chain piece is one story, but there's also another aspect that's that's coming to fruition. And this is the desire to look at other financial metrics. So if you think about uh, you, you know, the trade-off in a, a long supply chain is that you might carry more inventory. And so if you have a, a more agile or more dynamic um, you know, supply chain that's closer to where you're selling your goods, then you might not have to carry as much finished good inventory. So we could see you know, the, the auto sector, which historically had two and a half months of, of inventory relative to sales. Those dealers have been loving life lately where they've got much tighter inventory, but they're able to command a, a much higher price and a price that has higher premium. Also, they're not having to carry the cost of carrying and holding that inventory. So so there are trade-offs in, in all of this. A, a third piece really is the that the tastes and preferences of the end consumer are changing, and that's having 
pronounced implications on businesses. So it used to be that you might make the same product a million times and sell the same product in a you know a variety of different markets and a variety of different locations with the same features. You'd include a manual that was printed in multiple languages, uh, but you were essentially mass producing one item. Now we see a lot of companies producing smaller lots, but a greater assortment. Uh, nowhere is this perhaps more pronounced right now than in fashion. So take a look at a, a company like Nike, that used to, uh, per, you know, they used to make a couple models of shoes. They'd mass produce them in the cheapest markets possible, lower costs, and then distribute those shoes around the world. Now you see them moving to a direct-to-consumer market, and and their goal in the coming years is to have over sixty percent of their sales go direct to consumer, where they're servicing that that customer. In fact, they've canceled some of the contracts that they've had in place. For many years, some since the very early days of the company with distributors around the world because they're going direct to consumer. They're really controlling those distribution channels. And they're also doing limited drops. So rather than mass produce a shoe and sell as many units as they can, they're coming out with more models and producing fewer numbers of those models, creating what they would call a little bit of hype in the market and, and you know, making it. Uh, a sought after model because it's limited in nature. Right. And and so in that type of market, you might actually want to be producing close to your end market so that you can produce the the shoe quickly, you can have it delivered to the to the customer quickly. Uh you know, if you, especially if you're doing fulfillment yourself, then you run it directly from manufacturing straight to the consumer. And so the, you know, the customization that we're seeing in some of these markets probably does dictate more localization in manufacturing, more localization in supply chains. So there, I think there's a, you know, a number of factors that are going to impact what supply chains look like going forward. It isn't just the outcome of, of the pandemic and what we experienced in the pandemic, but it's also the tastes and preferences of consumers. It's re-examining other financial metrics and you know not just cost of goods sold which is what we were historically focused on but looking at some of the other uh the other metrics that we might might look at and then also all of this technology is enabling things that historically weren't possible or or were only possible at a very high cost so greater automation removes some of the labor cost differential that we used to see also some of those labor cost differentials are going away anyways uh, so there, there's a number of factors that I think are are impacting it. It isn't just the resiliency that companies desired coming out of the pandemic. Mm. All right. Out of the frying pan, into the fire. We have to talk about artificial intelligence. And you cannot go a day without turning something on and hearing about it. John Maynard Keynes, the great British economist John Maynard Keynes, talked about, wrote about technological employment. And essentially, not quite, but essentially, it's the fear that machines, non-human um, factors of production are going to replace human factors of production. So far, that has not proven to be true, at least in the manufacturing sector. So I'm going to ask you, is artificial intelligence going to be different in that respect? Can artificial intelligence really create a non-human replacement completely for a human worker? I, I think what we see AI doing right now and what we anticipate AI being able to do for some time is, is certainly replace work and replicate work that humans could do. Uh, well, it, I don't think we will want to ever use that technology to fully replace what a human does because the human role is always going to be evolving. So if you think about how we're going to use AI, I think it will be to augment the human experience. All, you know, everything we're seeing lately with chat GBT and, and um, kind of iterative AI and, and uh, you know, some of the approaches we've seen in the last few months, it, what this means for manufacturers is that there's a, a new way of augmenting other pieces of your business. It isn't, again, just about autom automating production staff, but now we can use generative AI to 
augment what our marketers are doing, what are, you know, what other people in finance or HR or some of these other skill sets are, are doing. And again, I don't think it's to replace them wholly right now, but I think it will augment what they're doing, free them up to do other things. And certainly it, it without doubt will change the skill set that they need to be coming to the table with. So some of that for your existing workers will mean learning it on, on the go in the job. And for the workers that uh, will be coming into the workforce in the future, they've got to be learning that uh, in other ways, either through, you know, through schooling or other things to prepare them for what their jobs are going to look like moving forward. What's going on with the tech sector? Is it merely going through some sort of con consolidation? I mean, what goes up eventually comes down. We know that. Or, or is it something more fundamental going on? Because the swings have just been enormous. And now, of course, on the downside. What's your outlook for the tech sector, given what we're seeing? I think it really depends on which piece of the tech sector we're looking at. Uh, if you look at you know, manufacturing sectors here in the U.S., defense and space industries doing quite well, aerospace doing quite well, uh, you know, even autos now up on a year-over-year -year basis where, where non-auto manufacturing is, is slightly down on a year-over-year -year basis. So it depends on really which piece of the industry you're looking at. Certainly computers and you know PCs, smartphones, some of those categories saw great strength coming out of the pandemic in those early months of the pandemic as we were making all of these adjustments. And you are seeing some, uh, some strong headwinds for those categories. But outside of some of those consumer-oriented categories, there's still a tremendous amount of growth. Uh, if you think that of the kind of broad narrative around Internet of Things and and all of the areas that that could impact, from you know hospitality to manufacturing to all, all of these other industries and sectors, there's still a lot of tech adoption that uh, is left to, to happen and and still will be happening in the years to come. So there is still great growth in a number of those areas. And as we saw from some of the supply chain constraints and the auto sector and elsewhere, technology is showing up in more places than ever before. And it isn't uncommon today for a, a modern vehicle to have 50 plus semiconductors in it. Yeah. And I think that's just the start. I think we're going to see a lot more. Now, take that same idea and apply it to every sector that we, uh, you know, that we interact with. I mean, there's a a lot of still very analog objects in our in our life, and you can see them all around you. Your mailbox is probably still an analog box. It wouldn't take much to make that digital, so that you got alerted when you had mail. Now, may, maybe yeah. that's not a use case scenario yeah. you care about, but it's just one simple example of an analog an analog object that could be digitized. Now play that out inside of a manufacturing facility. And there are so many things that could be automated that could be infused with technology. Cobots will enable things that weren't capable 20 years ago. Mobile robots will enable things that weren't capable you know, 20 or, th or 30 years ago. Uh, I'm seeing automation being added to a lot of existing manufacturing tools and you know the price points are coming down. So if you think about something like LIDAR sensors that were historically used to, to, to help with mapping environments and you know, used for uh, navigation automate and, and autonomous driving, those used to be $100,000 units. Now you can find them for under $1,000. So now you can add them to things like forklifts. You can start to add them to stock chasers and other uh, other tools inside of a manufacturing facility where in the past even just a couple of years ago the cost would have been prohibitively expensive now it's it's within reach so there's still a lot of growth that we will see in the you know in the tech sector uh, the you know layoffs at some of the biggest tech companies and biggest tech platforms have definitely stolen the headlines but behind the scenes there's still a lot of growth to come, especially when it when it comes to manufacturing and manufacturing across all of these different industries. 
Final question for Sean. And you alluded to it. It seems like every day we see headlines about the population of some country peaking at China, most notably, but we've seen other places. So dem demographically driven labor scarcity, scarcity, particularly in the West, although China, notably in addition, is creating labor shortages. And that's motivating uh, the use of robotics. Do you, this? so I'm gonna ask you about the, the quick, the, the short-term and maybe the long-term future of robotics. Are robotics going to in, accelerate in their use and are, are they gonna replace eventually human workers? I will definitely see robotics accelerate because they're becoming more agile and we're able to use them in ways that we weren't able to use them in the past. Moreover, the deployments are becoming less expensive. So now we can use them in places and the economics will work. In the past, maybe the economic dynamics didn't work. It was you know too, too expensive. So we we're only using them in certain places. Now we're starting to use them in more places. And you know, as you noted, uh, we've got demographic dynamics playing out. Even here in the U.S., it seems like labor force participation rates are stabilizing at about a percent below where they were pre-pandemic. You have in some sectors, especially manufacturing sectors, uh, a high average age of workers, a high median age of workers. And so you, you've got a dynamic where you've got uh, you know an aging workforce, you've got shortages in a number of places, you're trying to do more with the workers that you do have. And so, yeah, you're gonna use robots uh, in places that will augment those workers. You're gonna use robots in places where you can't find those workers. And the, the robots at the same time that we're going to be deploying in the years ahead are, as I noted, becoming more agile. So they can be used in more places and they're becoming less expensive. So we can start to use them in, in places where the, the economics previously prohibited us from, you know, from doing that. So I think there's a, a lot of promise there um, uh, of, of what's to come. Sean Dubrovic, you gave us your time. You gave us your expertise. Thank you very much for joining me in the Manufacturing Think Tank today. Great to be here with you, Cliff. To our audience, this is what the Think Tank is going to be. We're going to have deep dive discussions on critical issues. Some of them will be long-term structural forces, as we talked about today. But, you know, the world is still throwing us weekly surprises. They're going to have big impacts on the boardroom. Uh, manufacturing. We'll talk about all of them. Look forward to seeing you the next episode of Manufacturing Think Tank. And that's